if the family you're about to marry into is a direct recipient of the devil's good graces, and your life, once you say I do, is dependent on winning a game of hide and seek, what do you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made by Alex, Grace, and the cursed Ledamus family, what you should do, and how to beat the death game in Ready or Not. Two kids are running through the Ledamus mansion looking for a hiding spot and an ultra wealthy version of hide and go seek, which seems easier for the hiders since there's more places to hide. They must be balancing out the game somehow. Daniel hides Alex in a closet, then is confronted by a wounded man named Charles. Charles begs Daniel to help him hide. He's bleeding out from a spear in his gut. Daniel's a conniving little shit and alerts his family, who arrives in ceremonial masks. Despite the pleas of his bride Helena, Charles is shot with a spear gun again. He's then dragged into a special room to be ritually sacrificed. This is one of those situations that once you're involved in, you stand very little chance. I'm gonna make the bold assumption that at some earlier point, Charles made some poor decisions or ignored obvious red flags. You just don't find yourself in a deadly game of hide and go seek in Wayne's Manor being hunted down by generations of masked family members wielding spear guns. I could be wrong though. 30 years later, that little boy named Alex who was hiding in the closet now runs the successful a Domus Family Games Company and is set to marry Grace, a former foster child after having dated for just over a year and a half. Alex offers Grace a final chance to flee with him from his self-proclaimed horrible family. Grace insists that she wants to join them anyways. On her wedding day, Grace meets the Ledamuses, Alex's brother Daniel the Snitch, and his catty gold-digging wife ironically named Charity, Alex's disapproving father Tony, and uniquely friendly mother Becky, who tells Grace that when she was getting married into the family, she too wasn't as popular because her blood wasn't blue enough either. The most disconcerting of the family members is Helena, with her permanent resting bitch face. It's clear she's poorly coping with past trauma. Moments later, everyone gathers for the ceremony, and Grace and Alex are married. After the wedding, the newlywed bride and groom head back into the room to get intimate. They're rudely interrupted by Helena's freakish scowl. She ominously tells them that she hopes they can hide better than that, and reminds them that they need to join the family for game night now. Grace scoffs that of course they have secret doors, which Helena snuck in through. Alex clarifies that it's a servant's corridor that runs all through the house. He then nervously explains to Grace that as per tradition, since they made their fortune with games, every new addition to the Lady Thomas family has to join the family for a game night at midnight after the wedding. Grace asks what type of game. Alex lies and tells her that he doesn't know, that she draws a card to choose. It might be checkers, backgammon, croquet, or twister with Helena. He says she doesn't have to win, only to play, and that it means more to the family than the wedding itself. Grace is puzzled, but is willing to play along to officially be accepted into the family. She tells Alex that she'll meet him downstairs for the game in a few minutes. Alex is a royal scumbag for suckering Grace into what he knows is a game which could end her life, like Helena's husband, who he heard getting murdered from within the closets back when he was a kid. He made several subtle mentions that his family was horrible, and that they should run away together and leave his family behind. He knows the wretchedness that takes place within the mansion, yet lured Grace in anyways. Earlier I had thought that Charles had to have neglected obvious red flags for him to suddenly find himself in a sick life and death game. Now I'm not so sure. Grace and Alex had been dating for almost two years. She had known his family for some time prior to the wedding, and there weren't any real obvious red flags up until this point. It all seems like a weird mix of unsavory characters and traditions afflicted with proximity to billions of dollars. Grace seems like a cool girl with a full head on her shoulders. She couldn't have known what was in the center of the thing that she was biting into. Grace enters the music room where the family is waiting. After Becky schooled someone on the phone to get here by midnight, she talks with Grace and tells her that all she asks is that she brings Alex closer to the family family. Seems like there was some animosity and separation for some reason. Definitely has nothing to do with everyone despising one another, yet bound anyways by a money cow in the devil's traditions. Alex joins back up with Grace. He's visibly nervous about the game night, but covers, saying he just feels a little sick. Alex's friendly drug addict sister, Emily, and her pompous husband, Fitch, exchange pleasantries, but are rudely interrupted again by Elena. Elena's not a fan of Emily, or really any of the ladies. I think we all know why. Tony 
he ushers Grace and the family into a special room memorializing his great-grandfather, Victor Le Damas. Tony explains his ancestor Victor Le Damas made a deal with a man named LaBelle to build the Le Damas' fortune in exchange for the family observing a tradition. Every new member draws a game card from the LaBelle's puzzle box on their wedding night. The family passes Grace the box to draw a card from it and pick the game. Charity says she got chess, while Fitch got a game called Old Maid. Grace takes the box and draws Hide and Seek. The room falls dead silent. Alex's face goes white, Daniel hangs his head, and Becky looks worried. Grace, still confused and trying to stay lighthearted, asks who hides and who seeks. Tony says that since it's her initiation, she will be the one to hide. As everyone leaves the room to begin the game, Alex quietly tells her to meet him in their room after Tony briefs her on the rules, which are as follows. She can hide anywhere in the house. They will count to 100 and try to find her as soon as she leaves this room. They will turn off all the cameras in the house to play the game as his great-grandfather would have, and she has to stay hidden until dawn to win. Grace leaves the room totally ignorant of what's at stake to go hide while Tony hands out weapons from Victor Le Damas's personal collection to each family member. The game is about to begin. Tony forgot to mention a couple minor rules. See, Victor Le Damas made a deal with the devil himself, Mr. Le Bell, and his offer of fortune came at the cost of a deadly curse. The rules he left out are, should the new addition to the family draw the game hide and seek, the ignorant newcomer must hide and be hunted down by the family. The weapons used by the family must only be the traditional weapons kept in the family room. The newcomer is to be captured, not killed, and brought back to the family room for the final part of the ritual, a satanic incantation performed followed by their sacrifice before dawn. If they fail to end the initiate's life or compromise the game in any way, all family members will die. Now, how does the family know that the threat is real? Three possible ways. I'm guessing the dealing of extreme fortune came as a surprise. Their fortune was acquired not through skill and strategy, but by luck and external forces. Their unworthiness of the wealth signaled the power LaBelle wielded, thus making his threat credible. Alex later mentions relatives who mysteriously died after ignoring the terms of the deal. As we later find out, LaBelle made a supernatural appearance in front of Alex when he was five years old. The other family members were skeptical that he was young and imagining it. But this, coupled with the mysterious deaths and fortune, were enough to make them think twice about crossing LaBelle's rules. Could Alex have prevented Grace's twisted fate some other way? Could the family have circumvented LaBelle? The way I see it, they have seven potential options. Some are certain death, others might be worth exploring before murdering innocent people. One, not playing the game. This flat out doesn't work. It's established by the family that previous refusing couples all suddenly died shortly after. Two, not formally marrying. Alex later mentions one of the rules is that marriages have to be performed at the Le Damas mansion. While Vegas or common law is out, keeping new additions to the family as girlfriend boyfriend or intimate offshore business acquaintances might be worth trying. The nuances of what constitutes an addition to the family is unclear, and trying to semantically game the system could easily result in their deaths. Considering what happened to refusing couples in option one, none of them would be inclined to attempt this. Three, fleeing from family. Alex seems to think that this was an option. Before the wedding, he asked Grace if she wanted to just run off with him and leave his demented family behind. This is different from option two in that they would no longer be a part of the family or have access to its riches. A total separation based on what they know could work, should a family member choose a partner that is ill fit to be part of the Le Damas family. Which brings me to the next option, choosing partners carefully. Tony wasn't being a jerk for no reason when he asked Alex if Grace was a Le Damas and character. This game night ritual with the occasional sacrifice is clearly a filter so that only those deemed corruptible or morally impure will be initiated into the Le Damas family. Tony, Becky, and Helena are distinctly aware of why Charles was sacrificed, and the bumbling fool Fitch or the sociopathic gold digger Charity were successfully initiated. Grace's unfortunate receipt of the hide-and-seek card was most likely because she was too moral, or red-blooded as Becky pointed out. Mr. Label realized that she wouldn't be the sole seller type and chose to have her sacrificed. Alex would have known all this, and being the CEO of the Ledamus Gaming Dominion, he should have figured out that the LeBell's game was deterministic, not probabilistic. The deterministic nature of the game to root out the moral, the holy disciples, the good in man, meant that Grace would never have drawn anything besides hide and seek. Alex should never have chosen her as a wife. 5. Let them choose. If he and Grace really wanted to get married and take their chances, he should have told her everything so that she could make an informed decision. This 
isn't a problem as his brother Daniel later is revealed to have told Charity about the curse prior to the wedding. 6. Only Half Flings Tony Ledamis mentioned that a three-year courtship process is expected, which Alex shortened by a year. It's not clear if after those three years they have to marry, or if you have to eventually find someone to marry at all. They could sabotage all relationships prior to the three-year mark. Maybe not the most fulfilling life, but better than the alternative. 7. Keep the bloodline pure. Children don't need to go through the marriage game process. What lengths would you be willing to go to avoid having to murder a loved one's spouse? This is the only non-violent way of having children and expanding the family. I never said these were good options, though. Now that Grace and Alex got married and she pulled the card, the Ledamuses have to kill her, or they themselves will die. What can Alex and Grace do at this point? While Alex is supposed to stay in the Ledamus game room while the hunt is completed, if he's feeling guilty enough, he can leave the room to help Grace escape. After Grace drew her card, he told her to meet him in his room. If she's there, he can help her. If not, he will have to find her before his family does, while not revealing his intentions. If they find out he's trying to save Grace, they will kill or detain him. Of course, this would ensure his own death and the death of his entire family, which is also why the Ledamuses need to keep an eye on Alex to ensure he doesn't fuck him over. Grace has no idea that she's being hunted down to be sacrificed to the devil. There's nothing she can be expected to do, not even to stay hidden until dawn. It's a dumb kids game, and Tony saying that she needs to stay hidden until dawn to win came off as a joke. So why would she stay hidden for more than an hour? Grace needs Alex to warn her, or to get a lucky break in the initial attack. Grace nonchalantly finds her hiding spot in a dumbwaiter. The Ledamuses count to 100 and begin hunting her, with the exception of Alex and Charity. Alex, for obvious reasons, and Charity to guard the entrance to the sacred sacrificial room. Alex leaves the room through the servant's corridor, but is quickly found out by Charity when she returns moments later. Grace gets gets tired of hiding in the cramped food elevator and leaves to forfeit the game. Luckily, Alex finds her before the others and quietly pulls her into one of the rooms. They both hide behind the bed while one of the maids comes into the room looking for the two young Ledamus boys running amok. Grace witnesses the maid get brutally maimed by a shot to the face. <laughs> She then hears the family scolding Emily for accidentally shooting the maid instead of Grace, and how they needed to maim her and not to kill her for the sacrifice. Tony, Helen, Daniel, and Becky come in to help move Claire's body because they don't want Grace to see it and get spooked. Grace is completely shell-shocked, but Alex manages to get her into the servant's corridor before Emily comes back for her gun. He then tells her that his family is cursed, and that if they fail to win the game, which means killing Grace, they will die at dawn. Grace is understandably pissed the fuck off that Alex involved her in this. He exclaims that nobody ever draws that card, and that he thought the chances were worth it. And, this last one's good, he blames her for wanting to get married and be a part of his family, even though he hid the part about them being cursed by the devil and how she may have to be sacrificed. Alex at least has the decency to help her flee despite the consequences to himself. He tells her that he's going to the security room to disable the lockdown, and she needs to run the other way to the service kitchen, which is near an exit of the mansion that she can escape through. All these slasher movies make it clear that you're incredibly vulnerable in meat space. What they don't make clear is how vulnerable you are in cyberspace. Protect your cyber self with this video's sponsor, Private Internet Access. Private Internet Access is the world's most transparent VPN provider, with over 30 30 million downloads. By changing your IP address and rerouting your internet traffic through an encrypted tunnel, Private Internet Access hides your online activity from the unduly prying eyes of your internet service providers, network administrators, and government censors. Can you trust Private Internet Access? Yes, because their VPN is 100% open source and their code is public so anyone can see how secure and private their service really is. They never record or store user data, and their no-logs policy has been proven multiple times in court. This is surprising unique, and for those interested in credible protection, totally necessary. If you're a power user with specific needs, Private Internet Access is the most customizable VPN on the market. For the non-power user, it also works with all major streaming services and fully supports peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and torrenting, so you have unrestricted access to all your favorite content. Speed matters, which is why they use world-class next-gen server infrastructure in over 75 countries, meaning you get a secure, reliable VPN connection with unlimited, unthrottled bandwidth. With. Signing up for private internet access is risk-free. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee, plus their highly skilled customer support team of experts is available 24-7. Use my link in the description to get complete digital privacy for just over $2 per month with a three-year plan and two months free. Alex is an idiot.
idiot for not realizing that the game is deterministic, and a piece of shit for not telling Grace about the LaBelle's game ahead of time. The dumbwaiter is an obvious hiding spot, and one of the first places I'd check if I was a Ladamus. Then again, Grace couldn't have been expected to hide in a good spot since she thought the game was harmless. With their lives on the line, the Ladamuses should have guarded Alex better, or brought him with them to keep him in sight, as well as lock the security room. Alex has too strong a motive to cause them to lose the game. The first of the Ladamuses' many screw-ups is handing a drug addict a firearm and sending her out into the mansion with maids, butlers, and their kids all running around. And had Emily accidentally shot Grace in the head and killed her, there may have been dire consequences for the family. Unfortunately, Grace and Alex's phones were confiscated, so calling for help is out. Alex's plan is simple but effective. Disable the locks and get Grace out. The execution, however, was flawed. Grace is mentally gone right now. She should not be left alone to navigate the giant mansion she's unfamiliar with. She also can be easily overpowered by a couple of the Ladamas family members should they find her. Alex needs to have Grace stay put in the servant's corridor, tell Grace how long it will take him to disable the locks and what to do if he's not back in time, and then have her wait for him to come back so that he can guide her to the exit while fending off any family members that spot them. If they were hell-bent on splitting up for good, Alex should have at least told her how long it might take him to disable the security system so she doesn't prematurely make a break for it and get caught at a locked door. This is all assuming that the windows are made of a strong plexiglass that they couldn't throw a lamp through, in which case disabling the security system is the only way out. Grace rips the bottom of her dress off and heads down the corridor where she reaches two doors on either side. She picks the wrong door and walks out into the hallway Helena, Alex, and Tony are dragging the maid's corpse through. The drugged out Emily opens fire with her pepper box multi-barreled pistol. Yeah! Grace managed to duck out of the way and come out unscathed. Emily drops the gun, so Grace runs past her to get away from the others. She flees into another room to try to escape with no luck. Alex still hasn't disabled the security system. The windows are locked and the phones are down too. She's trapped. Daniel walks into the room, almost ignoring Grace at first. Being disillusioned with his satanic family, he gives her a 10 second head start, then alerts his family. Charity and the others show up. She tells them that Alex left the game room. Emily throws a fit about losing her pistol earlier. Fitch graciously hands her his crossbow, since he still couldn't figure out how to use it after all those videos on the john. Unlike Fitch, Emily's a bit of a natural. When another maid runs into the room to tell them that she saw Grace, Emily accidentally fires a bolt through her mouth. Mr. Ladomas, I just saw her run. They try to form a new plan to stop Alex and find Grace, but keep getting interrupted by the maid's deathly groans. Helena finally gets fed up and decapitates her with an axe. Oh, what the fuck? In desperation, their new plan is for Tony and Daniel to go turn on the cameras to give themselves an advantage, while the rest fan out to find Grace and Alex. Since Alex failed to disable the security system, Grace devises a plan of her own. She sneaks back into the unattended game room where all the old weapons were stored, and grabs the elephant gun with its bandolier of ammo. It's time for some payback. Grace's premature exit out the wrong side of the servant's corridor is exactly why Alex should have guided her or told her how long it would take to disable the security system. Why are the Ladamases still dragging the maid's body around. Not only are they wasting precious time, but they're far more likely to be seen by Grace or leave a blood trail she'd find. It would be far more effective if they just rolled her up in the rug, stuffed her in a closet, and locked the door. Emily needs to get benched. Why they gave her one of the most dangerous, effective weapons in the first place, and why they didn't take it away from her after she shot the maid is beyond me. She nearly killed Tony, Daniel, and Helena. The Ladamases should have planned, prepared, and trained much better for this night. They're all splitting up, not taking it seriously, getting high and drunk, haphazardly checking random areas instead of clearing the house directionally, and giving guns to untrained, undisciplined morons. If I'm being honest, the Ladamas is f***ed up way before all this by choosing idiots for partners and poorly parenting their children. New additions need to be morally corrupt, not brain-dead substance abusers. Turning on the camera should have been done from the start. Again, this ritual is about filtering out moral newcomers. The only goal that needs to be satisfied is sacrificing Grace by dawn. When they fan out to find Grace, they should be paired up stupid with smart. This way, a 2v1 ensures that when they find Grace, they can subdue her, as well as keeping the morons of the family in check. They also should be directionally and thoroughly clearing areas to be sure that Grace doesn't sneak into a previously checked area. Since the doors and windows are still locked, Grace's plan to go back to the game room slash armory was a good idea. The elephant gun was the only weapon left, which she promptly picked up. I don't think she loaded it though. It'd be wise for her to practice dry firing and reloading to make sure she knows how to operate it. The Ladamas family is pretty big, so she's going to be reloading a lot. Grace does have the advantage that they have to be careful to only maim her while she can outright kill them. Grace finally makes it into the service 
kitchen. The doors are still locked. Who knows what happened to Alex? There's no time to wait for him to do his part. Grace tries to blast the door open, but the gun won't fire for some reason. Before she can figure out why, the butler, Stevens, arrives to grab a late night snack. Grace slips around the corner and ever so softly slides a .57 Nitro Express cartridge into the breach while the butler is singing. She sees the exit door getting disabled and makes her move on the butler. He doesn't budge, so she pulls both triggers. Nothing happens. The butler reveals that she loaded display dummy rounds and attacks her. Grace hits him over the head with a boiling pot of water. Stundy grabs the kitchen knife and starts blindly swinging at her. She can't make it past him, so she runs off in search of another exit. Meanwhile, Alex bashes the security system to prevent Tony and Daniel from reactivating it. Tony's not too happy about the situation. He knocks Alex unconscious and they handcuff him in another room. Seriously, why are all the maids, kids, and butlers wandering around while the purge is going on? Not that it would have mattered, but Grace should have loaded the gun as soon as she picked it up. It should be obvious that the gun wouldn't have been kept loaded. That said, she can't be blamed for not knowing that they were dummy rounds. That was the same wall that the Laydomises grabbed their guns from. It's unfortunate because seeing Grace nuke Stevens with the 8 bore would have been cool. Alex understandably didn't want to kill his dad even though he poses a grave threat to Grace. He's too conflicted emotionally. He did do a good job of destroying the security system though. Now that the doors and windows are unlocked and the cameras are off, Grace should have free reign to pop open any of the exterior windows or doors and escape. She should also start a fire with the candles. A large fire would signal emergency services and disrupt the Laydomis' hunt. Grace's new plan is to go back and hide in the same dumbwaiter she originally hid in, except another maid is hiding in it. The maid then starts yelling, trying to alert the family that Grace is there. When she tries to get out of the dumbwaiter, she accidentally hits the elevator button, crushing herself in it. That is a strong food elevator. Damn. Grace is forced to flee the scene before anyone else arrives. Stevens rejoins with the family to give his report. He was unable to repair the security system, meaning the doors and windows are still unlocked. And Dora, their favorite maid, was crushed in the dumbwaiter. The Laydomises feud with each other for a bit, then head back out in search of Grace. They won't be finding her inside, though. Grace is standing on the windowsill just outside the room they cuffed Alex in. Grace jumps off the roof, somehow managing not to break her ankle, and sprints for it. She gets pretty far, but someone's out there with a flashlight blocking her path. Grace decides to hide in the nearby stable, which proves to be a poor choice as the person with the flashlight starts searching it moments later. It's Georgie, Emily's son. Grace asks him to help her escape, but Georgie's too indoctrinated by his psycho family. He pulls out a pistol and fires at her. <laughs> Luckily, he missed anything vital and only blew a hole through her hand. Grace knocks Georgie out cold before he can get another shot off. She's then startled by a goat, causing her to fall into the goat pit. It's not just goats, though. This is where the Laydomises dump the bodies of previous spouses that drew the hide-and-seek card. She one-handedly climbs out of the goat pit via the rickety wooden ladder. It breaks just as she reaches the top. As her bloody hand slips off, she slams her wounded hand down on the protruding nail. The hole in her hand catches the nail, which Grace uses uses to pull herself up. The family might have heard that gunshot. She quickly bandages her hand up with a piece of her dress and heads for the fence line before others show up. Grace really needs to stop trusting anyone associated with the Laydomises. Everyone should be treated as a threat from now on. Leaping 10 to 15 feet to the ground in front of a giant window was dangerous. Not only could she have twisted an ankle, putting herself at an even worse disadvantage, but if Fitch or anyone else was looking out that window at that moment, she'd have been caught. When Grace was cut off in the courtyard by Georgie with the flashlight, she should have stayed put and kept behind the tree out of his view by watching where his light was shining. Georgie was most likely heading over to the stable to search it since it's an obvious hiding spot. It was stupid of Grace to run over to it, but not as stupid as revealing herself to Georgie. The Laydomises should have done a much better job of disposing of the bodies. If anyone got suspicious of why multiple people went missing the night of their wedding at the Laydomis mansion, this would have been one of the places that they'd check. Grace was lucky that she was able to make it out of the pit on that old ladder. Once she got out, she should have thrown Georgie in the hole and taken his gun. It was the same pepper box that Emily had. There might still be ammo in it. Even if there isn't, it could still be used to scare off the Laydomises. Charity sees Grace run from the stables and takes a shot with her harpoon gun from the mansion terrace, which totally misses. Grace makes it to the fence line, but she's too weak and wounded to climb it. There's a broken piece of the fence that she's able to fully snap off, creating an opening barely large enough for her to squeeze through. She makes it through to the other side, gashing herself in the process. Grace then tries to flag down a car, but they speed off yelling at her to get out of the road. Grace understandably gets a bit upset. You fucking animal, you piece of shit! Catching a ride isn't working, so she runs off into the nearby woods. 
Stevens drives by shortly after and sees the broken fence. He reports back to the family, saying that Grace fled into the woods, but that he will find her and fix the broken fence in the morning, of course. Meanwhile, Alex finally regains consciousness. Realizing Grace must be in danger, he starts trying to saw his handcuffs through the bed frame. The butler finds Grace running through the forest. He runs her down with his car, tackles her to the ground, and tries to shoot her with his tranquilizer gun. Grace knocks it out of his hands, gouges his eye and burnt face, then chokes him out with her dress's waist ribbon. Uh, motherfucker! She jumps into the car, peels out, and hits the OnStar button to call for help. The attendant is a useless NPC that despite her cries that people are trying to kill her, tells her that the car was reported stolen so they have to shut it down. Grace puts her head down, thinking the police must surely still be on their way. Stevens catches up to her before they arrive, breaks the window, and shoots her with a tranquilizer dart. Grace completely stumbled at the finish line. When she made it past the fence, trying to flag down oncoming cars was far too risky. It easily could have been driven by one of the late Domuses, or one of their employees looking for her. Luckily, it wasn't. I don't know how she got surprised by a car in the dark, quiet forest. She definitely should have seen him coming and hid. When Grace gouged Steven's face, she should have immediately ran and taken off in the car. Trying to choke him out was too risky. Stevens is much larger and stronger than she is, and easily could have overpowered her, rolled out of the choke, or pulled the fabric away from his neck as it's rather wide and large. Had she taken Georgie's pistol and shot down Stevens, finished him off by backing the car over him, or shooting him with a trank gun, she wouldn't have gotten recaptured. The OnStar Trip Safe service needs to be sued into oblivion for immediately shutting down a vehicle with a driver that is in fear of her life. Waiting in the shutdown car was a terrible decision. It should have been obvious that Stevens was the one who reported it missing, since choking someone out for 10 seconds does not kill them despite what most movies indicate. He knows the direction Grace went in, and will be coming after her. Stevens reports back to the family once more that he captured Grace and he's making his way to the rear gate with Grace tied up in the back seat. He cranks up some celebratory jams, too loud to hear the Laidamuses warn him that Grace woke up and is about to attack him. Just as he figures it out and turns back, Grace kicks him in the face multiple times, causing him to crash and flip the car into a ditch. Grace wakes up before Stevens and climbs out of the car. Before she can run away, Daniel finds her. Daniel doesn't want to kill her, but he has no choice. He knows his father is secretly watching from the tree line. He rifle butts her and they take her back to the sacrificial chamber. Stevens should have anticipated how long the tranquilizer would have lasted, hog tied her so she couldn't kick, and had the family meet him en route to escort him in case Grace got free again. I don't think Grace popping the door and rolling out of the moving car would have worked out too well. She'd likely get more injured and with her her ties, Stevens could easily stop the car and grab her again. Her hands were tied in front of her, which means she could have choked him out with a rope from the back seat. This is preferable because kicking is way more difficult and easier to defend against. Stevens could keep his head down and hit the brakes, then kick her ass. With the choke, he's locked into the headrest. She was lucky she woke up before Stevens after the crash. Realistically, his seatbelt would have prevented him from getting KO'd, and Grace would have had her head ping-ponged around the car frame. While the Laidamas family prepares to sacrifice Grace, Alex is still trying to saw through the bed frame with his handcuffs. After the family drinks from a cup of wine as part of the ritual, they all begin to vomit, except for Daniel, who non-lethally poisoned the wine with hydrochloric acid, coming to the belief that his family deserves to die and that the cycle of sacrificing people needs to end. Alex finally gets free and heads to the ceremony room. Daniel frees Grace and they attempt to leave the house. They get caught by his wife, Charity, who, not wanting to lose her life and riches, fatally shoots him in the neck. <laughs> Grace fights the gun out of Charity's hand. The bolts are gone, so she pistol whips her and runs to find an exit before others come. Tony gets in her way, still trying to overcome the hydrochloric acid burning his esophagus. Grace grabs a nearby lantern and bludgeons him over the head. You're just another sacrifice. <laughs> She then tosses it on the ground, which sets the mansion on fire. Grace is then attacked by Becky with a bow and arrow. She misses Grace and tries to strangle her. While losing consciousness, Grace yanks on the tablecloth, which causes LaBelle's box to fall next to her. She grabs it and smashes Becky's skull in with it. Fuck your fucking family! Alex walks in to see Grace on top of Becky, holding LaBelle's box with Becky's bloody hair stuck in it. He realizes that Grace will never stay with him now, so he turns on her and gives her up to his family to complete the sacrifice. For the life of me, I don't understand why Alex was trying to saw the bed frame through with his handcuffs. His feet were not tied down. He could have used his feet to kick through the center of the beam where it's weakest or push off the bed. Apparently, all the Laidamuses are incompetent fucking morons. Guess that's why they had to sell their souls to the devil. There is no way they'd have been this 
this wealthy without doing so. Daniel's choice of non-lethal poison was understandable. He didn't want to kill his family, and he didn't fully believe that the curse was real or that they'd die if Grace was freed. Unfortunately, the acid was diluted enough to not stop his family for long. Daniel trying to close the distance while I talked Charity down was the only play. Charity was just too much of a trigger-sensitive gold digger. Grace is a resourceful fighter. They had numbers on her, but were all far too incompetent with their weapons to kill her, and their lack of coordination led them to attacking her one at a time. Grace justifiably no longer trusted Alex. By that point, she was too spent and delirious seeing the man she once loved to escape him. They continued the sacrificial ritual by holding Grace down themselves. Alex places the bloody LaBelle box beside her and takes hold of the sacrificial blade. Emily's psycho children eagerly stand in the audience. Once the chant is complete, Alex pronounces Hail Satan and plunges the knife towards Grace's heart. Grace claws the hands, pinning her left arm to weaken their grip at the last second so she can twist her torso, causing the knife to miss her heart and be driven into her shoulder. She breaks free from the table and holds the dagger toward the family while screaming. <laughs> Helena opens the curtains and reveals that the sun has already risen, meaning it is now too late. The Ladamus is braced for death, but nothing happens. Helena plans to kill Grace anyways, for obvious reasons. She grabs the axe, but before she can swing at Grace, she spontaneously combusts. Bitch explodes next, followed by a begging Charity. Emily tries to get away with her sons, Georgie and Gabe, but they all burst too. Tony tries yelling about how he followed the rules, but he turns into paste as well. Alex then tries to weasel his way back into getting Grace's forgiveness, but she hands him a ring and says she wants a divorce. Alex explodes too. The fire from the curtains then spreads around the house, and for a brief moment, Grace sees the spirit of Mr. LaBelle sitting in his chair. He gives her a nod of respect for a game well played. Grace walks out of the mansion like a boss boss, wearing her torn, blood-soaked gown, leb sneakers on, covered in Ladamus guts, gunshot hole in her hand, gash across her back, knife wound in her shoulder, beaten, choked, tranked, mansion burning behind her, walking through the wedding field she was happily married at yesterday evening, smoking Becky's cigs as first responders arrive. Grace's timing and strategy was impeccable, twisting at the last second to take the knife into the shoulder instead was clutch. Had she done it a moment sooner or later, Alex would have stabbed her again, or she'd have the knife in her heart. Heart. Seeing the ghost of LaBelle is sure to keep her on the straight and narrow from here on out. It's gonna be tough explaining what happened here, but I think there's enough evidence that Grace could not have caused their deaths. The goat pit is evidence that they murdered Charles on his wedding night a long time ago, and that Grace was just another victim. Let's recap the decisions which could have altered who lived and died. Honestly, I don't think Charles or Grace could have seen this coming. It was up to their spouses to have figured out that the game was a filter, and picking good-hearted partners was a death sentence for them. Alex should have been able to figure this out and sabotaged his relationship with Grace or tried running away with her before the wedding. If he did, the Ladamases and their staff would have survived, along with Grace. Of course, this means the curse isn't broken, and the Ladamases are still fated to sacrifice other moral newcomers, since they are too dumb to circumvent the curse in one of the ways I mentioned. I think the death game from Ready or Not was beaten. Thanks for watching, and remember, don't make deals with the devil.